Hello and welcome back to a new teaching series entitled The Glory of Righteousness. This is the first session in which we're going to talk about the origin of the human conscience. Do believers in Christ need to confess their sins? If yes, how should it be done and what is the importance of it? If they don't need to confess their sins, why not? Can genuine born-again believers ever lose their salvation? In this series, we will have an extended discussion about the practice of confession of sins, about conscience, righteousness, eternal security, and about overcoming temptations and living in holiness. Now, I have to admit and provide a little warning to my listeners that some of the things that I'm going to share here are usually challenging and difficult to accept for a vast majority of Christians. However, I still encourage you to listen to the end. And as you listen, put aside the things that you don't understand temporarily or things that you are not ready to accept yet. Because the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. John 14, 26 tells us this. He will guide you into all truth, John 16, 13. And he will give you peace. That's the most important. The challenges of these topics don't derive from the fact that I'm looking to share something new, out of the ordinary or shocking. The challenges come from the fact that these topics are quite different from the way they have been approached and practiced by the mainstream Christianity in general, especially when it comes to confession of sins, righteousness, and eternal security. However, there are things that I was convinced of by the Holy Spirit from the Word of God and about which I cannot stay silent. What is presented in this series is what the Holy Spirit has revealed directly to my wife and I, precept upon precept over a period of about 13 years. And these revelations were also shaped, refined, and confirmed by the teachings of various pastors and teachers from the body of Christ, like Joseph Prince, maybe you heard of him, Chris Oyakilome, Curry Blake, Andrew Womack, and Ryan Rufus. I am eternally grateful and thankful for these people of God through which God has worked so mightily in our lives and brought so much revelation, freedom, and peace. And I want to give God and them the credit they so much deserve as well as to attempt to pass on to other people this powerful message of grace and righteousness to the best of my ability. As a general principle, a lie does not become truth just because it has been propagated for hundreds of years throughout history or because the majority of people has accepted it as truth. From time to time, people of God need to reevaluate some of the existing doctrines in Christendom to see if they are really in line with the Word of God. A good friend of mine shared with me a funny story from his family when he got married and used to go to his wife's family for different holiday dinners. He noticed that while his family was preparing to do some roasted pork legs, they would always cut and throw away a good part of the, of the pork legs. And my friend started asking the ladies who were cooking, why did they do that? The answer that he got was that they always did it that way because that's what the recipe called for. So he began a little investigation on his own in his wife's family to find out why they did it the way they did it and threw away such good meat. He asked his wife, his sisters-in-law, his mother-in-law until he found out the reason behind it. His wife's grand -gra great grandmother first cut that part of the pork legs because they didn't fit in her cooking tray. Wow, that is quite a reason, isn't it? It's hilarious, I know, how a silly habit can be passed down from generation to generation without ever being questioned. But it's true, it happens a lot of times and in many areas of our lives. I'm sure you have your own examples of the kind. And some of the beliefs that you hold today as a Christian might have been simply taken from your parents, pastors, friends, and teachers without ever being challenged or questioned in a constructive way. 
you're probably not even aware of this. You don't need to believe everything I say here or take my word for it, but consider this time while you listen, a season of re-evaluation of some of your beliefs and check again for yourself from the scripture and with an open mind if what I'm saying is according to the scripture or not. And I would like to begin creating the context for the discussion about confession of sins and about righteousness by first talking about the human conscience and its purpose. The first big part of this series is entitled The Human Conscience, and it will tackle the origin of the human conscience, its purpose, its place in relation to the law of Moses, and the consciousness of sins or of dead works that the conscience can generate. In this first session, we will talk a little bit about the origin of human conscience, and let's begin by reading Genesis 2, 15 to 17, where it says this, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God gives here a command to Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that he would eat, he would surely die. Then Satan comes and tempts Eve with deception by bringing doubt about the word of God that was spoken to them. And as we all know, Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree and something interesting happened to them when they did that. Besides the fact that their spirit died instantly and it was separated from God. Let's read it in Genesis chapter 3 verses 6 to 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant, pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves, to, uh, fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. This passage tells us that the moment they ate from the fruit, their eyes were opened. What eyes? Didn't they see before? Of course they have been seeing perfectly before, but they have been walking and seeing by faith. They were dominated more by the spiritual world in their inner vision and perception. The spiritual things were more real to them than the physical things. However, when they ate of that fruit, their perception of spiritual things diminished and their perception of the physical things became dominant. And we consider it to be normal today the way you and I see, we feel, and think right now. But it's actually abnormal compared to the way God created us initially. And through the new birth, we receive a new spirit inside of us that is capable again to walk by faith and not by sight. Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 7 and 17 the following. Verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And verse 17, a powerful verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are called to walk by faith in what the word says about our new identity and not walk by what we see with our physical eyes. We can behold and perceive that all things have become new for us through the eyes of the new spirit. We as the New Testament believers should go back to the way Adam and Eve were intended to be and the spiritual realm together with what the new spirit, spirit holds inside of us should be more real to us than anything else. That has to become more real to us than this natural, physical, and tangible realm. It's so sad that very few Christians today live in and from that spiritual realm. We are physical carnal beings that are controlled and dominated by what we see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, Elisha's servant had his spiritual eyes closed and Elisha prayed that his spiritual eyes would be opened. 
Let's read that in 2 Kings 6 verses 15 to 17. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Don't fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You see, in this instance, it was the exact opposite of what happened to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve have been walking by faith prior to their fall. But when they ate of the tree, the eyes of their heart were closed to spiritual things and opened to the physical ones. Here, on the other hand, Elisha's servant had the eyes of his heart closed to spiritual things and opened to the natural ones. But when Elisha prayed for him, God opened the servant's spiritual eyes so that he was able to see by faith what Elisha was already seeing. Coming back now to Genesis 3 verse 7, it says there that the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Let's continue reading up to verse 11, from 8 to 11. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Let's focus on verse 11 for a moment and think about it. Who told you that you were naked? This is not talking about just being without clothes. Who told you that you were defeated? Who told you that you were sick? All these things that came because of sin, where did you get this knowledge from? Who told you all these things? This is so important. Where did you get this knowledge? And here comes into play the human conscience. First, Satan didn't tell Adam and Eve that they were naked. There is no scripture to indicate that. When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they intuitively and automatically recognized their nakedness, their sin, and their failure. And immediately fear and shame came as a result. And the very fact that God asked them, who told you that you are naked, shows that God was not the one who told them. He was the one that asked them the question. God didn't tell them that they were naked. Where did they get this from? How did they know that they were naked so that they would go and hide from God? Think about this. The Lord has never given them a reason to be afraid of Him or threatened by Him. He created the perfect environment, the perfect world, and everything was awesome. There was no reason for them to be fearful towards God in the sense of feeling threatened by Him. It's obvious that this knowledge came from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you know, God knew that they were naked before. They were not clothed in the glory of God or in a robe of righteousness as some people preach. Uh, Because we can clearly see this in Genesis 2 verse 25 where it says this. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. If they had been clothed in some kind of robe of glory or light or righteousness, they would not have been naked. And this verse, this statement would have been an incorrect statement. But the Bible says that they were both naked, the man and his wife. God knew that they were naked, but he never mentioned it to them. He never wanted them to be aware of that. He didn't create us, the human beings, with a conscience. The conscience is defined as the faculty of being able to discern right and wrong in one's own actions. 
God didn't create us with this ability to sit down and judge ourselves and constantly evaluating whether we are right or wrong. He created us innocent. Adam and Eve were completely naked and they were not ashamed. Now let's think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for a moment. The name of that tree is descriptive of our conscience, isn't it? When Adam and Eve ate of that tree, that must have been the place and the time when they received a conscience. It was either God created them with an inactive conscience, uh, which was activated when they ate of the tree, or the tree actually gave them a conscience. And I'm not exactly sure which way was it, but I tend to believe that the tree is what actually gave them a conscience. And the reason I say this is because of what the Bible says about the tree of life in comparison with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we see that in Genesis chapter 3 verses 22 to 23 where it says this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Clearly this passage compares the two trees and the result of eating from their fruit. Both trees were imparting something. The tree of life would have imparted eternal life to men, uh, while the tree of knowledge of good and evil imparted the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, this last tree was, uh, has imparted something to Adam and Eve as well. God didn't create Adam and Eve with a conscience. That came because of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What was the fruit of the conscience? The very first fruit that came was what we already saw in Genesis 3 verses 7 to 10. That their eyes were open and they knew they were naked. The conscience immediately has made them self-conscious and it focused their attention on themselves. Adam and Eve were not one bit more naked after they sinned than how they were before they sinned. Nothing changed in the natural. It was only their perception that changed and the conscience does this today as well. It makes us self-aware. Adam and Eve were naked before sinning, but they didn't even notice it because they were God conscience. That's amazing. And in the New Testament, we're supposed to walk exactly like that, by faith and not by sight, to be more God conscious than self conscious However, allow me to add this. Even if you get so God conscious now in our day that you don't notice whether you have clothes on you or not, please have mercy on the rest of us that are still carnal and wear clothes. Adam and Eve were so God conscious that they didn't even know that they were naked. But this changed when they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They became self-aware and fixated on their self when they received the conscience. Shame came on them. They weren't ashamed before, but all of a sudden the conscience brought shame over them and fear of punishment. Did you know God never wanted us to experience such emotions? He never wanted us to be afraid. He didn't create us for rejection, but for fellowship. He didn't intend for things to be this way, but after Adam and Eve sinned, it became necessary to have a conscience. And that's interesting. You might say now that it would be nice if we could get rid of our conscience. Well, not really. Do you know why? Because for, the, for a lost and fallen human being, a conscience is a necessary evil. Your conscience makes you aware of your sin and shows you your need for forgiveness. God had to give us a free choice to serve him by freedom of choice. Otherwise, we would not have been true free moral agents. We would not have been serving and loving him only because the, uh, we would be serving him only because there was no other option. And he had, he, had, he had to give us this option. And I don't believe that the alternative to the tree of life was by accident the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
The moment they ate of that tree, they received a conscience which even though had all these negative effects, such as, such as shame, fear, and fear, and it also provided a good function to show them and us that we have sinned and have come short of the glory of God and that we need forgiveness. I believe that God planned all of this. It says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, uh, this, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names haven't been written in the book of, uh, haven't been uh, written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This verse shows that God has a plan in place even in case we were going to rebel at him and sin against him, which we did. And Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Long before he even created us, he had already put a plan in place for that route. And Jesus had already accepted that plan to come down to earth and redeem us. That is extraordinary. Imagine this for a moment. You were God and you were going to create humankind. If you knew that there was a possibility for man to rebel against you and that they were going to do all these terrible things, the Holocaust and all the atrocities are happening in the world, the divorces, the ungodliness, the hatred, the hurt and the pain that enter the human race, would you still have done it? Probably not. The only way I can understand this is that God saw you and me, those who would accept his payment for sin and who would become new creatures, those who would be born again in his likeness. He looked at us and thought that you and I were worth all the pain and all the suffering involved. You know, the value of something or someone is measured by what you are willing to pay for it. You may look at you and at the world and around you and think that we are not worth much. But the very fact that God Almighty was willing to send His Son, His only Son, to die for us put a huge value on us. The scripture here said that He was slain from the foundation of the world. God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden with a purpose. In case we were going to violate His instructions, we would receive the conscience that immediately would start condemning us. This is what I wanted to share with you today. And in the next session, I will share a few consequences of the, of the conscience as well as how does the conscience affect us. Until we meet next time, may God surround you with favor, joy and peace like a shield in all your ways. Amen. Thank you.